section twenty nine of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty two an american skipper gives important information jack leads a boat attack on a slaver in the rio frio capture slaver blown up the supple jack exposed to a hot fire the corvette and brig in the harbour of paranagua slavers attacked several prizes made fired at from the shore engagement with a fort prizes destroyed carry one off a man overboard picked up his hair turns white the corvette and brig had been cruising for some days in company having chased several vessels some of which got away while others were found to be honest traders they were some way to the southward of cape frio when land just being in sight a brig was made out standing towards them she hoisted american colours and as she approached passing close to the corvette a man who appeared to be her skipper standing on the poop deck hailed if you will heave to i will come aboard you as i have information to give the corvette was immediately brought to the wind her fore topsail backed the brig performing the same movement when a boat was lowered and a stout florid man a yankee in appearance from truck to kelson dressed in quaker costume came alongside in her quickly climbing on deck without making the usual salutation performed by visitors to a man-of-war he advanced towards murray and introduced himself as captain aaron sturge of the brig good hope bound for boston this ship i guess friend is one of the cruisers engaged in putting down the slave trade he said murray replied in the affirmative and inquired what information he had to give it is this friend i have just come out of the rio frio where i left a wicked-looking craft called the rival nearly ready for sea which will carry i guess six hundred slaves at least she is a vessel i heard that the british cruisers have been long looking after so if thou dost wish to catch her now is thy time and i would advise thee to stand in at once and thou mayest cut her off as she comes out or what would be more certain catch her before she puts to sea murray thanked the yankee skipper for his information and invited him below no friend i thank thee the sooner thou art on thy way toward the coast and i on mine northward the better thou wilt do thy best to take this vessel murray assured him that he would and would lose not a moment in standing in for the land the honest skipper then shaking hands swung himself down the side into his boat and returned to the brig which stood away to the southward while the tudor and supplejack hauling their wind stood towards the coast murray hoped to be off the mouth of the harbour some time after dark he hailed jack and told him what he intended to do his plan was to send the brig in with the boats and capture the slaver before she got under way or should she sail that evening catch her as she was coming out as the vessels drew near the land a sharp lookout was kept on the chance of the slaver having put to sea but no sail appeared in sight and some time after nightfall having got well in with the land they hove to to wait for daybreak just before dawn murray dispatched two of his boats one under charge of higson and the other of the master with directions to jack to stand in directly there was light enough to see his way jack having a good chart felt confident of being able to take the brig in without a pilot directly the first streaks of dawn appeared in the sky he put the brig's head towards the harbour the sea breeze set in sooner than usual and having a leading wind he rapidly stood on towing the boats he was soon passing through the narrow entrance 
i see a number of fellows coming along the beach some of them with arms in their hands they probably suspect us and will give us some trouble when we are coming out again said bevan i shall care very little for that provided we get hold of the slaver i only hope that she has not given us the slip answered jack there she is sir high up in the harbour cried bevan her topsails are loose and had the wind held she would probably have been under way by this time we have her safe enough now however said jack the brig stood on for some way but the wind fell light the current was running out and the channel here was far more intricate than the part already passed through jack determined therefore to bring up and to board the slaver with the boats those selected for the expedition eagerly leaped into them jack took command of the whole five in number leaving bevan in charge of the brig it is possible that the brazilians may imitate the example of those fellows at bahia and attempt to attack you said jack to bevan you will therefore keep a good lookout and allow no boat to approach under any pretence whatever order them to keep off and fire a musket shot or two ahead of them as a sign that you are in earnest if they still come on fire the carronades into them and drive them back as you best can the boats shoved off and made good way towards the slaver jack observed a horseman or two galloping along the shore but no attempt was made to molest the english though they passed round a couple of points within musket shot at last the slaver was seen at anchor right ahead the expected prize before them the boat's crews gave way with a will jack's boat leading he had ordered hickson to board on the port side while he attacked on the starboard the schooner's sails though they had been loose when first seen had in the meantime been furled one man only was visible on board her he was composedly walking the quarter-deck with a glass under his arm through which he had been watching the approaching boats as they got close he hailed in broken english and ordered them to keep off no no we intend to come aboard and examine that schooner cried jack and i say you shall not answered the man if you attempt it you must stand by the consequences we intend to do so give way lads shouted jack as he spoke the schooner's ports were opened her hitherto silent decks appeared crowded with men while the next instant four guns run out on either side let fly a shower of grape and canister while twenty or thirty men opened fire with muskets happily the guns did no damage for the boats were already close up to the schooner's sides though two or three men were slightly wounded by the bullets which came in sharp thuds against the gunwales board her my lad shouted jack and he and his followers threw themselves quickly on deck the slaver's crew stood their ground for a few seconds only then throwing down their cutlasses and muskets they sprang overboard and attempted to make their way to the not distant bank a few had been cut down at the first onslaught half a dozen yielded themselves prisoners and two had tumbled into the boats making eight in all captured the others in shoals were swimming for their lives the seamen irritated at the opposition they had met with would have shot them down but jack ordered them to desist these fellows are not to be treated as enemies now that they have abandoned their vessel it was their duty to defend her he shouted out knocking up their muskets we must now get her out of this before their friends collect on the shore or we shall find it rather a hot berth i suspect the cable was cut and the boats taking the prize in tow began to make way down the harbour they had not however got far from the spot before several shots struck the schooner fired from some men who had already collected on the shore no one was hurt and she was soon beyond the range of the muskets as the breeze increased it became very hard work towing the schooner against it still jack determined if possible to carry her off as they approached one of the points which they had to round they observed a number of armed men collecting on it to avoid them the schooner was kept over to the opposite side just then a squall struck her and drove her on a bank the brazilians encouraged by this opened a hot fire and though at some distance several of their shot struck the schooner in spite of it jack ordered warps to be got out 
and endeavoured to haul her off two of his men had been hit and he in vain endeavoured to get the prize into deep water ahead was a bank over which he found it impossible to haul her she had driven indeed into a bay shoal water being found ahead astern and on her port side it must be done though i am sorry to lose so fine a craft we must blow her up he said to higson several casks of powder were found on board they were placed in her hold surrounded by such combustible materials as could be quickly gathered together all hands were then ordered into the boats jack with higson and needham set her on fire simultaneously amidships and fore and aft they then jumped into the boats and jack anxious to have his men safe from further risk of being shot gave the order to pull down the river as fast as they could lay their backs to the oars the brazilians probably fancied that they had taken to flight and three boats which had been concealed behind the point were now seen shoving off for the schooner they had got more than half way towards her when the flames burst out through all the hatchways still they pulled on hoping to extinguish them the people in the leading boat were on the point of jumping on board when the flames catching the gunpowder up she went her masts and spars shooting towards the sky with fragments of her decks while her sides split in all directions whether any of the brazilians were injured could not be discovered two of their boats pulled away in hot haste the third following far more slowly it was the general opinion that the people in her must have suffered severely as they were close to the side of the vessel when she blew up jack fearing that his vessel might be attacked made the best of his way on board on the arrival of the boats alongside bevan reported that he had not been molested but that he had seen a considerable number of boats pulling along the shore towards a spot further down where people were collected in crowds though jack felt perfectly confident that even should they venture to attack him he should beat them off being anxious to avoid bloodshed he resolved to get under way as soon as possible the breeze however still blowing up the harbour he had to wait till it died away and the land breeze assumed its power it was an anxious time for without a pilot he dare not attempt to head out of the harbour at all events if they do show their noses we can give them a taste of long tom sir said needham it's my opinion they will not come nearer if they hear him bark the brig lay with her sails loose and her cable hove short still not a breath of air stirred the glass-like surface of the harbour jack did not wish to risk the loss of his vessel by attempting to cross the bar without a leading wind besides which from the example the brazilians had given of their disposition they might take the opportunity of attacking her while passing along the narrow channel he would have to traverse he hoped to get out before nightfall at length the pennant which long had hung up and down the mast began to move again it dropped but at length out it blew steadily while here and there gentle ripples appeared on the surface of the water hands up anchor and make sail shouted jack the boats quickly towed the brig round the canvas was let drop and away she glided as she increased her speed the boats were dropped astern and now with a fair breeze the gallant little brig under all sail stood towards the mouth of the harbour as she neared the narrowest part of the channel a number of people were seen collecting on the beach on her approach they ran behind the high bank sheltered by which they opened a hot fire with muskets and rifles the bullets whizzing over the brig jack on this ordered all hands to lie down with the exception of the helmsman the man in the chains and the lookout forward while he himself stood at his post conning the vessel the wind held fair and after having been peppered for about ten minutes with a few stray shots sticking into her sides and hammocks and a splinter or two torn off the masts the supplejack bounded gaily out to sea having performed her duty and being able to laugh at her opponents none of the men struck had been much hurt so the affair was altogether satisfactory just as it was getting dark she met the corvette which had stood in as close as was safe to meet her 
the two vessels now stood to the southward for the purpose of looking into the harbour of paranagua a notorious slave mart about three hundred miles from rio they came off the bay or gulf as it may probably be called soon after dawn on the third day after leaving the scene of their last exploit on one side of the somewhat narrow entrance lay a fort in which they could count fourteen or fifteen guns frowning down upon them we might have some hot work if we were entering an enemy port observed murray the brazilian officer in command will however scarcely dare to molest us even though he may be favourably disposed to the slave traders as a precautionary measure however the crews were sent to quarters and the corvette leading the two vessels stood into the harbour as he approached murray dipped his flag the salute being duly returned from the fort he accordingly stood on intending to run up to the harbour till he came in sight of the vessels he expected to find there jack following his leader did the same and passed unmolested the two men-of-war proceeded on for some distance but no vessels appeared and murray began to fear that the slavers had had some intimation that the port was likely to be visited by british cruisers and had slipped away in time ahead lay an island with buildings on it some were dwelling-houses others were long sheds of a suspicious character as the water was still deep and the channel tolerably wide he stood on when rounding a point he saw several large vessels lying at anchor which from their appearance as well as from the sheds and leaguers or huge casks for holding water which lay on the shore together with planking for slave decks and other articles easily distinguishable through the telescope he had no doubt were slavers as the channel at this point became very narrow and intricate he thought it prudent not to stand on farther and dropping his anchor he ordered jack to do the same he then got a spring on his cable so as to be able to bring his broadside to bear on the vessels and to cover the boats which he intended to send forthwith to attack them there is a stir among the vessels observed adair and two of them have got under way and are standing out towards us murray accordingly ordered him and higson to board them and ascertain their character one carried the british and the other the american flag the boats were lowered and the two vessels in a short time coming up were boarded neither of them made any resistance their papers were found to be correct they were honest traders as soon as we saw you approaching we two agreed to stand out from among the black sheep the rest of the craft in there are one and all slavers and if you take or destroy them they will only get their due said the american master he then gave a description of the vessels and the number of guns and men they carried terence thanked him for the information and the two vessels were allowed to continue their course down the river murray now ordered five boats under the command of jack to board and overhaul all the vessels lying at anchor off the island one was a large ship two were brigs and a fourth a wicked-looking schooner evidently a slaver the question was whether they would offer resistance the ship was seen getting a spring on her cable which looked something like it jack was therefore prepared for all contingencies we will take the smallest ones in detail and that big fellow will then see that he has no chance of assistance he said to higson further off lay another large ship with the brazilian colours flying and two barks one an american the other a portuguese with a brigantine which as needham remarked from truck to kelson had the cut of a slaver we will take them all lads never fear they have got into a net and it will be a hard matter for them to make their way out again the truth is they thought we should never find our way up here but they have discovered their mistake and have made their last voyages with blackies aboard i hope the boats were pulling on steadily towards the first brig a beautiful vessel with sharp bows and clean runs she would be a prize worth having jack knew as she would give no end of trouble to the british cruisers engaged in the suppression of the slave trade a number of men were seen on board but as the flotilla approached they jumped into their boats and pulled for the shore the brig was immediately boarded when not a soul was found in her though she had her cargo on board she was completely fitted for the slave trade 
jack suspecting treachery had her thoroughly examined all's right sir said needham the crew were in too great a fright to think of anything but saving themselves or they might to be sure have laid a slow match to the magazine and tried to blow us up the only pity is that she has no sails on board it will be a job to know what to do with her jack had in the meantime sent the other boats to take possession of the second brig this also was abandoned by her crew she too was found fully fitted for the slave trade they now headed the boats towards the ship the broadside of which having been brought to bear on them she was apparently prepared for a determined resistance ordering adair to pull for her stern and higson for the bows jack and needham dashed up alongside as they approached the ship opened fire with round grape-shot and musketry but as is often the case when men fight in a bad cause the slaver's crew took uncertain aim and no one was hurt in either of the boats the brazilians had soon cause to repent of their folly in attempting to defend themselves the english seamen quickly climbing up the side they at once gave way and rushing across the deck sprang overboard and attempted to swim towards the shore some of the seamen enraged at the opposition they had made picked up the muskets from the decks and would have fired after their retreating foe had not jack as on a previous occasion stopped them let the wretches though they deserve punishment have a chance for their lives he said several boats putting off from the shore picked up most of the swimmers though some were seen to go down before they were rescued the ship was a remarkably fine one called the andorinha on examining her she was found to be american built while the flag of the united states was discovered on board another discovery was also made her stern was covered by a piece of painted canvas on ripping off which there appeared the name of the mary jane of greenport in large letters and as she carried two whaleboats on her quarters the most vigilant of british cruisers might have passed her without the slightest suspicion of her real character leaving the crew of one of the boats on board the ship under the command of tom who was vastly proud of the confidence placed in him jack pulled on for the other large brazilian ship the captain received him on board with a smiling countenance for the fellow well knew that though evidently a slaver she could not be touched all the slave fittings had been landed and lay abreast of her along the shore the american brig which was next boarded was as clearly intended for the same nefarious traffic but as she had not yet been fitted up with slave decks though they also were discovered close to her ready to be shipped with her leaguers and other fittings the day's work was not yet over a brigantine lay temptingly near inviting a visit the boat soon surrounded her she was found to be the stella a vessel which had long eluded the vigilance of british cruisers though some of her fittings had been landed a sufficient quantity remained to condemn her jack however having to secure his other prizes was obliged to leave her intending to visit her the next day he therefore pulled back to the brigs and commenced towing and warping them towards the corvette the channel through which they had to pass was excessively narrow and unfortunately jack forgetting that the boats might pass in a direct line where the vessels could not follow they both took the ground now came the task of hauling them off it was accomplished however and they were brought at length to an anchor between the two men-of-war he next pulled back to the ship and reached her just as darkness came on he found tom and his crew on the alert he had seen a number of boats coming off from the shore with the intention he fully believed of attacking him but we would have treated them just as mr adair did the slave-dealers at bahia he exclaimed we had all our arms loaded and if they had come near us we should have given them a pretty warm reception you may depend upon that jack felt very sure that tom would have done so though he was glad he had not been exposed to the danger he would have had to run sounding as he went jack got the ship safely under the guns of the corvette at a late hour of the night the skulking crews of the slavers eager as they might have been to regain the vessels taken from them dared not attack them and the night passed off quietly next morning by daybreak the boats again put off 
the most important vessel to capture was the brigantine and they at once pulled for her as they approached they made out several boats pulling backwards and forwards between her and the shore jack regretted that he had not left a prize crew on board though he had acted as he thought at the time for the best give way my lads those fellows are after some mischief we must put a stop to it he shouted the brigantine lay floating on the calm water her taut raking masts and the tracery of her spars and rigging reflected in its surface she was just the style of craft to please a seaman's eye the men gave way in a few minutes they hoped to be aboard her suddenly her masts moved to starboard then over they heeled to port when gradually her bows sank and down she glided head foremost beneath the surface of the water what a pity broke from the lips of those in the stern sheets of the boats who had observed what had taken place the look of astonishment in the countenances of the men at the oars when turning their heads they found the brigantine had disappeared was almost ludicrous had they got hold of any of the brazilians they would have made them pay dearly for their trick it was very evident that the vessel had been scuttled during the night to prevent her from falling into the hands of the english while the crew had landed every article of value from her jack was thus compelled to be contented with his three prizes none of the other vessels could be touched it now coming on to blow hard it was impossible to get under way the time however was employed in fitting the ship for sea higson and a prize crew had charge of her murray intended to tow one of the brigs while jack was to tow the other all hands on board both vessels were hard at work till sunset the next morning the wind coming down the harbour they got under way and proceeded down the gulf in a short time the squadron got abreast of the fort the commandant of which was well aware that the english had in accordance with the wishes of his own government performed their duty in capturing the slavers and murray therefore expected to pass without molestation he saluted as usual and was standing on when a gun was fired at the corvette what are the fellows about he exclaimed it may have been let off by mistake observed adair that was not let off by mistake though exclaimed murray as a shot from a second gun whistled close under the stern followed immediately by another which however passed ahead beat to quarters cried murray the fellows mean mischief scarcely had the first roll of the drum sounded than the eager crew sprang to their guns jack imitated his example both vessels opened their broadsides firing shot and shell as fast as their guns could be brought to bear the fort meantime fired showers of grape canister and round shot this is hotter work than we met with up the st juan i did not expect such fun exclaimed desmond we had only muskets and we have now got big guns to pay back the compliments we receive observed archy who was standing near him yes but the enemy have stone walls instead of timber stockades to protect them said desmond it's very good fun though i don't call that fun cried archy as a round shot struck a seaman at one of the guns near them on the breast and laid him dead on the deck before he had time to utter a groan a grape shot the next moment hit another man on the shoulder and he was carried below two others were shortly afterwards wounded fortunately the wind held or the men of war might have suffered much more than they did the object of the brazilians was probably to compel them to abandon their prizes which would have undoubtedly been immediately taken possession of murray signalled higson to keep further off the fort to escape the risk of damage the english ships having passed the front of the battery had their sterns exposed to a raking fire from the sea face of it which they were unable to return in consequence of the vessels in tow one of the after guns of the tudor was however fitted for throwing shells and as murray could bring it to bear when the openings between the vessels astern would allow of it he occasionally fired one into the fort long tom did his duty and jack had the satisfaction of believing that his shot produced as much effect as those of the corvette on my word i should like to land and storm that fort to punish the rascals he exclaimed i am afraid that as it is on a friendly territory that would be unlawful observed bevan then people on friendly territory should not attack those engaged in the performance of their duty answered jack give them a parting shot needham we shall soon be out of range of their guns if the breeze holds 
i will do my best to make it tell said dick training long tom aft as far as possible he fired the effect of the shot was to silence the gun which had for some minutes annoyed them the most and it was conjectured therefore that it must have either killed several of the gunners or injured the carriage the next shot which came from the fort fell short of the brig as soon as the vessels were completely out of range murray ordered the anchors to be dropped a heavy sea setting over the bar at the entrance he considered it unwise to attempt crossing till the top of high water the place in which he had brought up was not however altogether free from danger on either hand were wild rugged rocks while a line of foaming surf stretched across the mouth of the harbour as it would be impossible to cross with the two prize brigs murray determined at once to destroy them the two cutters and the supplejack's jolly-boat were directed to perform this service tom and desmond agreed to go and see the fun and just as the brig's boat was shoving off they jumped into her unobserved by jack the boats having taken charge of the brigs towed them half a mile from the ships they were then set on fire and were soon in a blaze fore and aft when the wind having more power than the tide rapidly carried them towards the foaming breakers the corvette's two boats were returning when jack looking round to ascertain what had become of his boat caught sight of her close to one of the blazing vessels on the point of being driven among the dangerous breakers having discovered that the two youngsters had gone in her he naturally felt doubly anxious on their account and suspected that some accident might have happened to prevent her return instantly jumping into the pinnace with the best hands he could collect he pulled away for the boat the crew of which were labouring desperately to head her off the breakers he had gone but a short distance when he caught sight of the two brigs like huge floating bonfires gliding into the midst of the foaming waters which danced up wildly around them as if greedy for their prey a few seconds the vessel struggled with the wild breakers then their keels grated on the sharp rocks they rose and fell a few seconds more when the waters leaping triumphantly over them they were shattered into a thousand fragments which were scattered on every side jack's interest was however centred on the boat which was already awfully near the breakers and once in them her fate would be that of the slavers his men strained every muscle to reach her already scarcely half a cable's length existed between her and the inner line of breakers a foaming sea had burst close astern jack dashing forward shouted to the bowman to have a rope ready it was hove on board as he swept round and securing it he steered away from the dangerous spot two of her oars had been lost alongside the burning brig and another had been sprung and had not assistance come the boat and all on board would in another minute to a certainty have been engulfed as jack made his way back to the brig he was received with loud cheers from the corvette and prize he was thankful when he at length reached the deck of the supplejack feeling that he ought to punish the two youngsters for their misconduct though very unwilling to do so he contented himself with giving them a severe lecture and pointing out to them the fearful risk they had run of losing their lives when duty calls you it is quite a different matter he observed then never be daunted by danger your duty was to remain on board had you been lost i should have had double cause to mourn for you as you would have uselessly thrown your lives away that's just what admiral triton said to me observed tom to desmond jack is right no doubt about that by this time the tide had sufficiently risen to allow a passage over the bar and murray being unwilling to lose a favourable wind by a longer delay the anchors were hove up sail was made and the two men of war with the captured slaver leaving the fort astern dashed proudly out to sea they had however to keep their pumps going in consequence of the large amount of water which had rushed into them before the shot holes they had received could be thoroughly plugged murray then gave hickson directions to carry the slaver to st helena and after delivering her up to return to rio by the first opportunity the midshipmen were sorry to lose him for he never forgot that he had been their messmate and notwithstanding his few eccentricities he was always kind and considerate while he steered to the eastward the corvette and brig shaped a course for rio the result of the expedition had been the destruction of three noted slavers and the capture of a fourth while their owners had learnt an important lesson that the risks of the trade in which they were engaged were considerably increased and that it might possibly be wiser to abandon it 
next night during adair's watch a pampiro a squall off the pampas so called suddenly struck the ship the boatswain's shrill whistle summoned all hands to shorten sail happily the tacks and sheets were let fly before its full force was felt ned somers a foretop man on the lee yardarm with the nearing in hand was struck by the wild flapping sail and overboard he fell murray who had now come on deck saw the accident and the instant the ship could be brought to the wind ordering a boat to be lowered he cried out for volunteers to man her adair sprang into her and snatchblock took the bow oar other hands followed the man's cries directed them as they believed towards where he was floating away the boat dashed through the foaming waters but when they reached the spot the man was nowhere to be seen they pulled round and round it shouting to him but no answer came unwillingly at length adair put the boat's head towards the ship the men had not pulled many strokes when snatchblock felt a blow on the bow of the boat and by a sudden impulse there was no time for thought stretching himself over the gunwale he plunged down his arm and got hold of the missing man whom eager hands assisted him to haul on board summers was immediately passed aft and as fast as the crew could pull the boat returned to the ship the man who still breathed was hoisted on deck and placed under the surgeon's hands strange to say he seemed next morning to outward appearance not much the worse for his accident from that day however he was in reality a changed man once among the most high-spirited and joyous of the crew he became melancholy and silent though he went through his duty as usual about a month afterwards as adair was going forward he saw a white-haired man sitting on the combings of the fore hatchway where did that old man come from he asked of snatchblock i never saw so strange a thing in all my life sir was the answer last night when he turned in his hair was as black as mine and this morning when the hammocks were piped up it was as you see it that man sir is ned somers adair could scarcely believe what he heard till he spoke to poor ned who however not having a looking-glass did not seem to be aware of the change after this he grew weaker and weaker his nervous system when he fell overboard had received a shock which was too much for him murray had resolved to send him home when the surgeon reported that the poor fellow had not many hours to live before night he breathed his last and was buried in the seaman's wide sepulchre the ocean he survived the accident scarcely three months End of section twenty nine section thirty of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty three up the piranha murray's forebodings battle of punta obligado attacked by fire-ships schooner blows up jack and murray perform a gallant exploit murray wounded the batteries stormed tom and gerald carried off by gauchos hurrah my boy there is a prospect of more glorious or at all events more exciting work than slave hunting exclaimed adair as he came on board the supplejack from the tudor both vessels then lying in rio harbour when where asked jack up the piranha and immediately as far as i can make out murray has just received his orders and you will get yours before the day is many hours longer i conclude that small vessels are wanted for the work so you are certain to be sent has murray heard what we are to do when we get there asked jack yes to force our way up the river which a certain general rosas calling himself president of buenos aires has taken it into his head no one shall do and so of course he will attempt to stop us who is the fellow i don't think i have ever heard of him before said jack nor did i till murray told me and as he reads everything he of course knew all about the matter you have an atlas just get it out and i will try and impart the information murray gave me the river of piranha you see runs a course of many miles nearly north and south before it runs into the river plata on the east side are the provinces of paraguay 
entre rios and banda oriental and on the west and south those of santa fe and buenos aires comprised under the general name of la plata general rosas wants to unite these provinces under one confederation and to make himself dictator or emperor another party calling themselves unitarios want to unite them into one state and have for this slight difference of opinion for several years done their best to knock each other on the head his troops having blockaded monte video and captured some french merchantmen the french have therefore sent a squadron to take satisfaction and open up the commerce of the river plata we are going to join them as the buenos aureans have treated some of our merchantmen in the same way and rosa stares us to do our worst and declares that up to the river we shall not go by an old treaty it appears that the english and french governments having guaranteed the integrity of the banda oriental rosas was ordered to withdraw his troops from the territory and as he refused to do so his squadron besieging montevideo has been taken from him while the province of paraguay and that of corrientes have combined to overthrow his power in revenge for this he has closed the outlets of their rivers so as to put an effectual stop to their foreign commerce the parana though it looks of no great size on the map is broad and deep and even large vessels may make their way some four or five hundred miles up it the french squadron and some english ships are already off montevideo and as soon as we and the other vessels join them we are to begin the ascent of the river here is montevideo on the northern shore of this wide river of la plata which however looks more like a huge gulf than what we call a river in europe and here some way up on the southern bank is buenos aires there was a fearful ruffian called oribe who got the upper hand in some of these provinces and murdered all his opponents who fell into his power and he therefore got the appropriate name of the butcher don rosas with a devoted army of gauchos the wild horsemen of the pampas united with him and the two mild-mannered gentlemen together endeavoured to get possession of montevideo but being defeated rosas has since wisely kept to his own side of the river besides the horsemen he has managed to get together a good supply of heavy guns and flying artillery with which he expects to send us to the right about and our business will be to show him that he is mistaken that is all i know of the matter and i hope i have made it as clear to your mind as murray did to mine jack duly received his orders and the next morning by daybreak the corvette and brig in company with a few other vessels sailed out of the harbour they had a quick run to montevideo where they fell in with the english and french squadron consisting of several steamers and sailing vessels soon after their arrival the ships were ordered to proceed up at once to guasu one of the mouths of the parana a heavy gale however coming on drove the ships back the midshipmen were of course as eager as any one for the fun as they called it which they expected to meet with and were much disappointed at the delay which occurred the steamers could have gone ahead without them but as there were only four in the whole squadron two english and two french such a force would not have been sufficient for the object day after day they had to beat backwards and forwards a strong westerly wind blowing in their teeth giving general rosas time to complete his defences well there is one satisfaction exclaimed desmond if we had gone up at first we might have caught the enemy unprepared and lost all the honour and glory we shall now reap in thrashing him as to that considering that he and his followers are half savages as the commodore says i don't see that there is much honour and glory to be obtained observed tom faith now it seems to me that it does not much matter what kind of people the enemy are provided they have got arms in their hands and don't run away answered desmond these fellows fight fiercely enough among themselves and they are not likely to change when they have got foreign foes to deal with 
patty was not far wrong after all at length the weather moderated the steamers got up their steam and the sailing vessels hauled their wind and stood for the westward they had proceeded some distance when down came another pampero upon them and they were once more disappointed still the work was to be done and the english and french commodores were not men to be beaten by a difficulty days and nights together the ships kept at it doing their uttermost to reach the rendezvous off the mouth of the river at length they all met and the flag of england flying from the peaks of some and that of france from others in friendly proximity with a fair breeze they commenced their ascent of the mighty stream as they watched the distant shore on either hand it was difficult to persuade themselves that they were at a considerable distance above the mouth of the river still on and on they sailed with their glasses they could occasionally see horsemen galloping along apparently watching them although no opposition was offered indeed they were generally too far out of the range of field pieces even should the enemy have possessed any as the current was strong and the wind light it was slow work and often they did not make ten miles a day they had got about a hundred miles up when the commodore gave the signal for the squadron to anchor and they found that they were within three miles of a place called punta obligado on the right bank of the river where general rosas had thrown up some strong defences to oppose their further progress all hands were in high spirits at the thoughts of the fight which they expected would take place the next morning murray and the more reflective officers could not help thinking that fighting was a serious matter and that if a report that they had heard was correct before another day was over many enjoying high health and spirits might be laid low jack who brought up close to the tutor came on board with tom to pay their friends a visit their chief regret was that higson was not there to take part in the expected achievements of the following day we never know what may happen to us when we go into battle said murray as jack sat with him in his cabin in case i should fall i must get you to take this packet to stella she is ever in my thoughts and i am anxious to make arrangements for her future comfort and support for i doubt that she is as well provided for as she supposes her father spent most of his fortune in the wild schemes in which he took part and careless as i heard he was about his own pecuniary affairs he probably neglected to make due provision for his daughter had she married me she would at all events have enjoyed a pension as my widow and as those who would otherwise obtain it can do very well without any addition to their incomes i have left all the property i possess to be enjoyed by her for her life and you jack must undertake to see that my intentions are carried out of course i will my dear murray answered jack but you must not suppose that you are to be knocked on the head i hold to the belief that no man knows beforehand what is to happen to him though of course when he goes into battle he may be killed but his thinking that he will or will not will make no difference it may be true answered murray with a sigh but there is something within me which says that i ought to be prepared of course and i hope you are my dear alick said jack gravely a truly religious man like you always is prepared and i suspect that the weather together with the fatigue you have gone through and your state of health have something to do with your forebodings if you won't think me frivolous let me ask you what you had for dinner yesterday murray at first did not answer at last faintly smiling he answered well perhaps you are right and i dare say to-morrow morning i shall see things in a different light however in case i should fall you will see my wishes carried out jack again promised that he would do anything and everything that murray wished terence joined them shortly afterwards and the old shipmate spent a pleasant evening as did tom with his friends in the midshipmen's berth they did not trouble themselves with forebodings of evil and all talked eagerly of the fun they hoped to see before long a sharp lookout was kept during the night the steamers had their fires banked up as it was thought probable that the enemy might have prepared fire-ships to send down among them as soon therefore as it was dark the boats were sent ahead to row guard and to tow them out of the way so that they might drop down clear of the squadron the night however passed away without any occurrence of the sort 
and at daybreak the two commodores proceeded up the river in their gigs to reconnoitre the position of the enemy a dense fog which hung over the water enabled them to approach unobserved their return was anxiously waited for they quickly acquainted themselves with all they desired to know and immediately they got back the commanders of all the vessels were directed to repair on board the flagship to receive instructions they then learned that rosas had thrown up strong fortifications about three miles from where they then lay they consisted of four batteries two on heights sixty feet above the surface of the river and two in an intervening valley the batteries mounted altogether twenty-two guns some long thirty-two pounders and others of smaller calibre opposite the point was an island which occupied a considerable portion of the breadth of the river so that vessels going up must of necessity pass close to the batteries yet further to strengthen the position three heavy chains supported by twenty-four vessels extended across the river from the mainland to the island one end being defended by a man-of-war schooner mounting six guns while close to the chains ready to be let loose at any moment lay ten fire-ships a force of nearly four thousand men artillery cavalry and infantry was collected so the commodores learnt from their spies to man the forts and to oppose any force that might be sent on shore to attack them the sailing vessels were now formed in two divisions while the steamers formed a third to take up a position as soon as they had disposed of the fire-ships all on board the ships waited eagerly for the signal to weigh the hands had been piped to breakfast the meal was over still the fog prevailed suddenly a light breeze sprang up from the southward when the fog cleared and at a quarter to nine the signal was given for the leading division to weigh with eager alacrity the men sprang aloft to loose sails and in a few minutes the two divisions of sailing vessels were gliding up the stream the one to attack the northern and the other the southern batteries with directions to anchor about seven hundred yards from them with all sail set to stem the current they approached the batteries which immediately opened fire on the headmost vessels they returned the compliment with interest as soon as they could bring their guns to bear the thunder of the artillery breaking the silence which had hitherto reigned over the scene the loud roaring increasing as ship after ship got into action the wild gauchos fought their guns well and showered down on their assailants round shot grape canister shells and rockets which the ships returned with similar missiles french and english vying with each other as to who should load and fire their guns the fastest the roar of the guns the crashing of the shot as they struck the ships and the shouts of the men increasing every instant became perfectly deafening about an hour from the time the gallant little philomel got under fire the action became general several of the vessels were suffering severely on board the french commodore's brig especially the men were falling fast while numberless shots struck her between wind and water the effect of the terrific cannonading going on was to make the wind fall light and some of the ships therefore were unable to reach the exact stations assigned to them the consequence was that they were exposed more than would otherwise have been the case to the fire of the batteries murray had carried his vessel as close as he could and jack did not fail to follow his example round shot and grape came sweeping over their decks some of the missiles striking the hulls of the vessels others going through their sails and cutting up the rigging but the hotter the fire became the more the british seamen seemed to enjoy the fun tossing about their guns with right good will and sending shot after shot well aimed into the batteries i say this is pretty hot work archy observed desmond i wonder how long it is going to last i suppose till we drive the enemy from their guns and take possession of their fort unless they blow themselves up and finish the batteries in that way answered gordon but i say look there what are those craft about archy as he spoke pointed ahead where about a dozen vessels were seen bearing down on the squadron from the upper part of the river presently first one and then another burst into flames they are fire-ships cried desmond and if they come aboard they will blow us all into smithereens 
the steamers won't let them do that observed gordon see they are paddling towards them and will sink or tow them out of the way before they touch us i hope still the danger was imminent it was evident that the steamers could not take all of them in tow at once and while some were got hold of others might continue their course the commanders of the men-of-war made preparations for the reception of the fire-ships and got their boats ready to tow them away should they threaten to drift closer than was safe on came the burning masses the steamers had got hold of some of them that fellow will be down upon us before long sir said needham if we cannot manage to get her out of the way jack on this ordered a boat to be lowered needham followed by tom jumped into her and rapidly pulled for the fire-ship the difficulty was to secure the tow-rope while there was no time to be lost if the brig was to be saved many of the shot intended for the vessels came flying over the boat no one was hit in her however and needham managed to hook on the tow-rope to her stern the crew gave way and aided by the current just got her clear of the brig when the flames rapidly increasing needham saw it was high time to cast off and get out of her neighbourhood the crew had not given many strokes when up she blew and the fragments of her deck and bulwarks came rattling down over them for a moment it seemed that all in the boat must be destroyed jack who had anxiously cast his eyes in that direction as had also the two midshipmen of the corvette who were looking on thought that every one in the boat must perish jack regretted that he had allowed tom to go in her his anxiety however was soon relieved when he saw them emerging from the shower and returning to the brig the other fire-vessels passing clear of the squadron either drove on shore or went floating harmlessly down the broad stream till they blew up and sank the battle still continued raging as at first for the spaniards fought their guns with desperation and no sooner had one set of men been swept away than they were replaced by others a body of cavalry was also seen hovering about in the wood which backed the fort and when any of the artillerymen as some did could no longer stand it and took to flight they were driven back and compelled to fight till they were killed or wounded the action had continued with unmitigated fury for a couple of hours and there appeared no prospect of its cessation as long as the enemy's ammunition held out although the gunners were continually swept away fresh men as at first were driven up to take their places the number of casualties on board the squadron had greatly increased two or three officers and several men had already been killed and many wounded suddenly a still louder roar than the thunder of the guns was heard hurrah there goes their magazine cried desmond no see the schooner guarding the chains has blown up answered gordon pointing in the direction of the barrier placed across the river for a few seconds the enemy astounded by the occurrence ceased firing but the english gave them no respite and both parties immediately again set to work battering away at each other shot after shot struck the tutor but the crew kept up their fire with unabated vigour murray had forgotten all about his forebodings of the previous evening no sooner had the schooner blown up than he saw that the chain being left unprotected it might easily be cut through and the steamers would thus be able to pass up the stream and open a flanking fire on the fort the same idea had occurred to jack and he sent tom on board the commodore's ship offering to make the attempt murray had in the meantime sent archie gordon with a similar offer both being accepted they pulled away in their gigs towards the chains though several shot came flying by them and they were exposed to a hot fire of musketry they succeeded in reaching the chains had the schooner remained the attempt would have been hopeless as her guns with an ample crew had full command of the spot but the guns were at the bottom of the river and most of her crew had either been blown into the air or drowned still it was no easy matter to cut through heavy chains with cold iron axes and hammers murray and jack set to work and although bullets were whizzing over them and every now and then pattered against the boats they worked dauntlessly away there is one cut through at all events cried jack as he succeeded at length in severing one of the thick links 
murray had unshackled another the third however still remained they both worked away at it knowing that before it could be cut through the enemy might bring down some of their flying artillery and render their position still more dangerous besides which the sooner the ships could get up the more quickly would the victory be won a few more blows and we shall do it cried murray he was raising his arm to strike when he fell back into the hands of snatchblock who was assisting him go on jack he exclaimed don't mind me you will have it through in another minute jack though his heart felt very sad at the thoughts of murray being badly wounded or perhaps killed laboured away with all his might assisted by needham we will do it in a few minutes more cried jack bringing down his axe with tremendous force the chain was at length cut the boat's crews uttering a loud cheer at their success while the vessels which supported it swung to the current floating down towards the opposite bank give way now lads cried jack and the two boats proceeded as fast as the men could bend to their oars back to the boats jack saw murray lifted on board and carried below the surgeon expressed a hope that his wound was not dangerous though he had fainted from loss of blood jack had however to hasten on board the commodore's ship to report what had been done the steamers were immediately ordered to proceed up the river and flank the batteries jack's anxiety was increased by the knowledge that his ship was greatly exposed several of her people having fallen and the purser having been killed while assisting the surgeon below the french commodore's brig however was suffering much more severely a shot cutting her cable she dropped astern before another could be ranged with upwards of an hundred shot holes through her sides ten or twelve of her people killed and forty or more wounded the french and english vessels were now ordered up to place themselves within musket shot of the battery that they might assist the flanking fire of the steamers this they did in a most dashing way receiving a hot fire in return when one of the lieutenants of an english vessel was killed at length however the well-served guns of the squadron produced their effect the fire from the batteries began to slacken some of the guns being dismounted and the gunners driven from others the engagement had now lasted six hours at length only an occasional shot came from the shore but still the enemy's flag continued flying and the commodore made a signal for the boats of the squadron to rendezvous alongside his ship with marines and bluejackets prepared for landing to storm the batteries the ships were brought in as close as the water would allow to cover the landing the english forces consisting of an hundred and eighty bluejackets and one hundred and forty-five marines were the first on shore here they quickly formed terence with two boats crews from the tudor were among them desmond had accompanied his uncle they were soon afterwards joined by bevan and tom with the men from the supplejack so we are to have some campaigning said tom i was afraid my brother would not let me come at first but he thought as i had escaped the round and grape shot of the enemy which came rattling on board that i should not get into much harm on shore and i was very anxious to see the fun while the boats were disembarking the men destined for the attack the ships kept up a hot fire over their heads to prevent the enemy from rushing down to interrupt them i suppose the ships will cease firing when we storm the hill or they may chance to knock our heads off instead of the enemy said desmond no fear about that answered tom see they have knocked off already the commodore will give us the signal to advance before long depend on that on the crest of the hill a strong force was drawn up to oppose them without waiting for the french the word to advance was given and uttering three hearty british cheers the marines with fixed bayonets charged up the hill the bluejackets on their flank they were received with a hot fire of musketry but the gauchos brave as they were could not stand the bayonets of the marines as they saw them coming they took to flight on one side was a wood in which a body of the enemy were posted this was at once attacked by a light company of seamen and in a few minutes it was carried the french landing rushed up to the attack of the forts while the bluejackets pursued the flying enemy who now and then when they found themselves in sufficient force to make a stand turned round and fired at their pursuers bodies also of gauchos who had been hovering in the rear during the action came sweeping down endeavouring to cut off any of their assailants whom they might find unprepared to receive them terence accompanied by the two midshipmen and a small party of seamen carried away by their ardour after having assisted to clear the wood were considerably in advance of the main body the marines were at the same time in the act of charging a large body of the enemy who were again attempting to stand their ground 
hallo who are these fellows cried tom pointing in the direction in which he had seen a large body of the gauchos flourishing their long lances as they galloped fiercely forward they intend to try and cut us down and so they will if we don't drive them back with a warm volley cried terence prepare to receive cavalry the seamen had been drilled to act as light infantry and being armed with muskets and bayonets were well able to use them on came the wild horsemen firing their carbines when with lances at rest they charged full down on the body of seamen several saddles were empty but not till they had got close up to the bayonets did they wheel round apparently with the intention of retreating believing that they were doing so the blue jackets rose from their knees and imperfectly disciplined as they were for fighting on shore without waiting for their officers orders rushed forward in pursuit of the apparently flying enemy tom and gerald carried away by their ardour took the lead and having only their swords in their hands got ahead of the rest at that moment the horsemen once more wheeling charged with desperate fury against the partly broken square the seamen however again rapidly forming fired a volley which prevented the gauchos from cutting their way through them two of the gauchos however as they came up threw their lassos over tom and gerald who were at that moment in the act of springing back to gain the protection of the bayonets and greatly to their horror and dismay they found themselves dragged up on the saddles of the horsemen who with their companions galloped off amid the showers of bullets which the blue jackets sent after them among the few who amid the smoke from the muskets and the confusion had seen the midshipmen spirited away was snatched block we must get the young reefers back lads it won't do to lose them he shouted out and followed by a dozen of the supplejack's crew less accustomed to discipline than the rest he started off in pursuit terence seeing them going and not knowing the cause called them back but not hearing him they ran on hoping to overtake the fleet horsemen the gauchos discovering from the flight of their party in other directions that the day was lost continued their flight had they turned back they would probably have cut down the whole of their pursuers snatchblock compelled at length to return told adair what had happened rogers and my nephew carried off exclaimed adair how did you fellows come to allow that we couldn't help it sir indeed we couldn't answered snatchblock there isn't a man among us who wouldn't have given his own life rather than have let the young gentleman be carried off by the savages to be killed and eaten for what we know but their horsemen came down upon us like lightning and spirited them off before any of us saw what they were about well well i am ready to believe that none of you could help it and i am sure snatchblock that you would have risked your life to save the youngster said adair his rising anger appeased they have themselves alone to blame we must now see what we can do to get them back for the gauchos will look upon them as prizes of too much value to kill and though they are savage enough from all accounts they are not addicted to eating men or boys either that's a comfort at all events for i couldn't tell what those wild chaps might do with the young gentlemen observed the honest sailor if we might go off in chase maybe we should come up with them before long with that cavalry we shall have no chance of overtaking the gauchos and i can only hope that they will not treat their prisoners ill the lads have their wits about them if they have the chance they will make their escape answered adair you may trust the young gentlemen for that sir said snatchblock the recall being sounded adair with his party was compelled to rejoin the main body indeed he saw too clearly that any attempt to rescue the youngsters would be useless the only task now to be accomplished by the seamen and marines was to spike the guns and destroy the batteries which being quickly accomplished they re-embarked the crews of the vessels which had been most severely treated had work enough to do in stopping shot-holes and refitting the rigging which had been considerably cut up adair on his return having to pass close to the supplejack went on board to tell rogers of the unfortunate loss of the two midshipmen and to offer him all the consolation he could i would rather that anything had happened than that exclaimed jack you don't suppose that the gauchos have killed the poor lads adair said he hoped from what he had heard that they had not injured them and probably supposed that they had made a valuable prize in a couple of officers they questioned snatchblock further as to what he knew of the affair 
i would have given my right hand rather than have had the young gentleman carried off sir he answered you see sir we did not expect those horse-fellows would attack us on that side and we were not standing in shipshape fashion like the sodgers somehow or other also the young gentlemen were where they should not have been i'll allow and just then down the gauchos pounced upon us and all in a moment before we could sing out a couple of them whipped their lassos over the lads shoulders and hoisted them up on their saddles you may be sure sir we made all sail after them as fast as we could carry on but it was all of no use the horses four legs were better than our two and we were afraid of firing for fear of hitting the young gentlemen maybe the fellows carried them off to save their own hides poor jack felt very unhappy and at once pulled off to the commodore to consult him and some of the other captains as to what was best to be done it is only to be hoped that rosas will not treat them as he is said to have treated some of his prisoners and cut off their ears was the remark made when jack told his story of course every effort must be made to recover the youngsters and as soon as we can hold any communication with rosas we will send to demand their release and will offer to exchange any of his followers who may fall into our hands for them in the meantime such private means as are available must be employed and you and mr adair shall have every possible opportunity given you of carrying them out we will think over the matter and decide what steps under the circumstances it is best to take the general however has shown no inclination whatever to come to terms and notwithstanding his defeat it is evident that he intends to fight out the quarrel to the bitter end this was poor consolation to jack and terence who felt more cut up than they had ever been in their lives jack had not however forgotten murray and as soon as duty would allow him he went on board the tutor he found his old friend able to sit up at table in his cabin though looking pale and ill from loss of blood and certainly more fit to be in his cot you see jack that my forebodings are partly realized he said as his old shipmate entered at all events had the bullet struck me the sixteenth of an inch on either side my wound would have been fatal i am afraid from what the doctor says that it may be some time before i am fit for active duty and he advises me to apply to be superseded and to go home jack of course hoped that the doctor was wrong and that murray would be able to remain out till the affair on which they had been sent had been brought to a satisfactory issue but you look unusually grave rogers has anything happened jack told him all about tom and gerald's loss murray of course heartily sympathized with him and expressed his fears as his other friends had done that it would be a hard matter to get the youngsters back he suggested however that jack should try and get hold of some natives who might communicate with them and perhaps assist them to escape the suggestion gave him some consolation as offering a means of, of recovering the lads don't be cramped in your efforts for want of money said murray bribery with these fellows would go a long way and you know that my purse is always at your service and never more so than on this occasion i know it alick answered jack depend on it if i can fall in with any natives i will try what bribery can do with them and if my own means are insufficient i will come to you End of section thirty section thirty one of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty four efforts made to recover the midshipmen murray sails for england an offer from a native to recover the midshipmen the fleet ascends the parana the supplejack sent in search of the enemy's vessels chases a schooner up a river needham caught in a trap boat expedition schooner blows up and jack is blown up with her return no news of the midshipmen the supplejack commences voyage up the parana jack keenly felt the loss of his brother tom what might be his and desmond's fate it was impossible to say though he could not suppose that the gauchos savage as they were supposed to be would put the two young midshipmen to death 
he and adair had for several days made vain attempts to gain information about them their captors might by this time be hundreds of miles away all they could learn was that the troops of rosas having entirely abandoned fort obligado had retreated to a distance jack too heard that murray was certainly to be sent home in the tudor and for the sake of his friend he was glad of this but he then should lose the assistance of adair in his endeavours to recover tom and desmond he was seated in his cabin one evening after the work of the day was over with his head resting on his hands a very unusual position for him when lieutenant adair was announced beg him to come below answered jack and adair entered the cabin i am glad to say my dear jack that i am to remain out here instead of taking the corvette home which for murray's sake as well as my own i should have naturally wished to do but besides wishing to see the end of this affair with rosas i should have been excessively unwilling to leave the country till we can get back our young scapegraces i wish we could see murray looking as if he was in a fair way to recover still the doctors say he will do well and the thought of again meeting with his lady-love will i hope assist to bring him round he expects to find her in england though i fancy that he has not heard from her since we came out here i am indeed glad that you are to remain said jack what ship are you to join i am appointed to the commodore's ship but i have received directions to serve under your orders on board the supplejack which i assure you gives me infinite satisfaction as i have hopes that you and i by putting our heads together may devise some plan for the recovery of the youngsters jack of course said how glad he was when does the tutor sail he asked as soon as the wind will allow her said adair at all events i will go on board early to-morrow morning to see murray said jack the worst of it is that i must of course send a letter by him and yet i scarcely like to write home with the unsatisfactory intelligence that i have to give however they will be more anxious and alarmed if they do not hear so i must tell the whole truth and express my hopes that we shall recover the youngsters before long i must write the same to my poor sister nora observed terence i was half inclined to say nothing at all about the matter but as it is certain to get into the papers the poor woman will see it and be troubling herself about her boy and fancying that she is never to see him again for my part i feel sure however that the youngsters will turn up somewhere or other as it is my firm conviction from experience that a midshipman has as many lives as a cat or considering the immense trouble most youngsters take to expend themselves there would be no superior officers in the service what is the squadron to do next have you heard asked jack to proceed up the parana to santa fe de baxadar and to convoy down a fleet of merchantmen which rosas has shut up there answered adair whether or not he will let us pass peaceably up is the question he has still got plenty of light artillery which will prove excessively troublesome to us as they can fire from the top of the cliffs right down on our decks and as we may probably be peppered pretty severely for the greater part of the way it will not be altogether an amusing expedition though we may get plenty of the bubble reputation e'en at the cannon's mouth anything however is better than idleness we are not likely out here to meet with much besides fighting to amuse us observed jack however i am thankful to find that you are to join the brig and am much obliged to the commodore for it the two old shipmates sat talking for some time and as soon as terence returned to the corvette jack took out his writing materials and indited his letter for home 
he made as light of tom's capture as possible and spoke as if it was certain that he and desmond would find their way back again before many days were over he begged that his father would find out murray through admiral triton and from him learn where the bradshaws with miss o'regan were staying that his family might pay them any attention in their power he expressed a hope that after the piranha business was over he himself should be sent home and bring back tom safe and sound he tried to make his letter appear cheerful but in reality he never in his life before felt so much out of spirits next morning he took it on board the tutor and wished murray farewell you will do well depend on it alick he said you already look better and we shall meet again before long in old england murray smiled faintly his wound was painful though the surgeon assured him that it was going on favourably the officer who was to supersede adair having come on board the corvette the latter accompanied jack back to the brig he received an order directly afterwards to proceed in search of a schooner supposed to be in one of the numerous passages which carries the waters of the piranha into the river plata it is very well to say go but we must get a breeze first said jack a breeze soon afterwards got up but it came from the wrong direction it was however favourable for the tudor and jack and terence watched her as her sails were let fall and she glided away down the river they would for many reasons have liked to have been on board her few men after having spent several years on a foreign station can look without concern on a homeward bound ship which carries away friends and acquaintances while they themselves are left behind their chief regret was however that tom and gerald had not been recovered before she sailed previous to this numerous merchantmen had been for some time collecting at the mouth of the river awaiting the convoy of the men-of-war up the piranha they now lay at anchor together forming a large fleet with the flags of all nations flying from their peaks while fresh arrivals came gliding up to an anchorage and boats were pulling about in all directions jack and terence employed the interval in visiting the shore for the purpose of finding some one who would undertake to search for the midshipmen and endeavour to obtain their liberation or assist them to escape they could not however be long absent from the brig as a breeze might spring up and not a moment was to be lost in looking after the buenos Irian schooner they ran some risk in going on shore of being cut off by the enemy who might possibly pounce upon them the country people however very frequently came down to the beach with their provisions for which they were sure to obtain a good price and the two lieutenants hoped that through their means they might find some person willing to undertake the task about which they were so anxious at length one evening after the market people had taken their departure just as they were about to step into their boat a dark-skinned man with a coloured poncho over his shoulder leathern leggings and a broad-brimmed hat made his appearance from behind a bank and fearlessly came up to them though both jack and terence by this time spoke a little spanish they could not clearly understand him they made out however that he wished to accompany them on board the ship and that he had some information of importance to give well step in my friend said jack we will hear what you have got to say as we pull on board by degrees they made out that he had heard of their inquiries about the two young midshipmen and that he was willing to try and recover them provided he was sufficiently rewarded he confessed that he had lost his last real in gambling and being a ruined man he set but little value on his life or that he certainly would not have offered to undertake the task as he only demanded a hundred dollars they very willingly promised him the sum and who have we the honour of addressing asked jack jose gonzalves an 
hildago of pure blood answered the fellow drawing himself up with an attempted exhibition of dignity circumstances have brought me into my present condition your purity of blood does not much matter to us don jose gonzalves provided you bring back these young officers answered jack what means have you for carrying out your plan my own talent and perseverance replied the don in a self-satisfied tone well we must trust to that remarked jack how soon can you commence the undertaking when i can be landed at a spot some miles higher up the river i must depend on you for carrying me there this was a disappointment to jack and terence who thought that the man would at once have set out but he explained that general rosas had moved away to the northward and that the young officers would have certainly been carried in that direction just as they reached the deck of the brig the long wished-for breeze setting in jack gave the order to make sail the anchor had not left the ground when a boat from the commodore's ship came alongside with a dispatch for him his directions were to hunt down any of the enemy's vessels he could hear of and then to follow the squadron which was on the point of proceeding up the river the signal for the fleet to weigh was already flying from the commodore's masthead the steamers were getting up their steam dense volumes of smoke issuing from their funnels from the yards of the sailing vessels folds upon folds of snowy canvas were being let fall in all directions while the boats which had been absent were hurrying back to their respective ships two or three men-of-war alone were left at the mouth of the river to prevent any of the enemy's vessels from escaping and to keep up the communication with the admiral at monte video come this is something like work i wish we were among them exclaimed terence they will have rare fun going up the river our turn will come depend on that answered jack rosas is not likely to let us pass without giving us a taste of his flying artillery the supplejack was some hours in reaching the mouth of the river in which it was reported that one of the enemy's vessels a schooner had taken refuge darkness soon coming on jack was obliged to anchor and await for daylight to proceed up it a sharp lookout was kept however to prevent any vessel from passing down during the night without his knowledge two boats were in the water alongside and their crews with cutlasses in their hands and pistols in their belts were ready to start at a moment's notice the night was calm and clear and the shores on either hand could be distinguished with the dark line of the forest which extended down to the water silence reigned over the scene though it was occasionally broken by strange cries which came out from among the tall trees probably the death shriek of some animal seized by a prowling jaguar or puma jack and terence got all the information they could out of jose gonzalves who had been frequently up the river and felt pretty certain as to the locality where the schooner was likely to be found the brig was brought up in a bay or bend of the river a point running out ahead and concealing her from any vessel coming down the stream till close upon her this was a disadvantage in one respect as an approaching enemy could not for the same cause be seen from the supplejack and only a short time therefore could be allowed for getting under way jack had given orders that the bell should not be struck lest should the schooner or any other vessel attempt to slip out it might give notice of the vicinity of the brig jack and terence had turned in just about the commencement of the morning watch needham who was on the lookout observed beyond the point above the trees a white spot on which the light of the moon just then emerging from behind a cloud shone brightly guessing at once that it was the head of the schooner's fore topgallant sail he sent to call the commander jack and terence were on deck in an instant the latter jumped into one of the boats and pulled across the stream to intercept the stranger while jack ordered the anchor to be got up and sail to be made 
the wind came off from the shore on the starboard side so that though the schooner might manage to get out the brig could also make her way up the stream we shall catch her now at all events she is trapped said jack to needham the schooner's jib was seen coming round the point which she was compelled to hug closely jack might have done better by remaining at anchor as the schooner would not have so soon discovered the foe lying in wait for her directly the brig was perceived she put up her helm and quickly easing off her main sheet ran again up the river with the wind on her starboard quarter jack had to wait some time to pick up his boat when making all sail he stood after the schooner with no little risk of getting on shore though jose gonzalves affirmed that he knew every inch of ground the lead however was kept going and jack hoped by keeping as much as possible in the middle of the stream to avoid such a catastrophe the chase had had a good start and now getting into a reach where the wind blew right aft she was able to set studding sails when being very light she ran through the water even faster than before she was too directly ahead to enable jack to fire long tom at her unless he yawed considerably he got however at last to the end of a reach which brought the schooner on his port bow needham had been eagerly on the watch for the opportunity the shot flew through the lower sails of the chase but no spars were carried away and she stood on rapidly increasing her distance from her pursuer there was great risk however that at any moment the brig might take the ground still jack felt that it would not do to let the prize almost within his grasp escape the wind might draw ahead or drop and he might take her with the boats but instead of falling the breeze rather freshened and continued to favour the chase dawn at length appeared and as the light increased the dangers of the navigation somewhat lessened three more shots were fired from long tom the first struck the chase but what damage it did could not be ascertained while the second scarcely touched her and the third fell considerably short it was evidently of no use to fire again still as long as the chase could be kept in sight jack had hopes of coming up with her or at all events of discovering into what creek or passage she might run having the advantage of being able to make short cuts by channels through which the brig could not venture she got farther and farther ahead till she could only just be discerned in the far distance up the river the dark trees appearing almost to close her in as the sun rose the wind began to die away the channel became narrower and narrower at last it became perfectly calm the brig was brought to an anchor we must not let her escape cried jack out boats and as the wind will no longer help her we shall find her before long three boats were at once manned jack terence and needham going in them while bevan remained in charge of the brig jose gonzalves declined accompanying the expedition on the plea that should a reverse be met with he would be knocked on the head by his countrymen which would have undoubtedly been the case so jack was obliged to dispense with his services the men gave way with a will hoping soon to overtake the chase they pulled on however for some time without again catching sight of her although the shore offered abundant shelter to an enemy they were allowed to pass without opposition and concluded therefore that no force of armed men was in the neighbourhood a sharp lookout was kept on either hand for any opening into which the schooner might have made her way at last they reached the mouth of a narrow channel which perhaps connected the river they were on with some other stream or it might they thought possibly be a river falling into the first it was a question whether the schooner had gone up it and on the chance of her having done so needham volunteered to explore it while the other two boats pulled up the main stream jack was at first unwilling to let him go lest he might be overpowered at last however he consented ordering him not to attack the schooner but should he catch sight of her to return immediately and follow the other boats with the information jack and terence accordingly continued their course while needham pulled up the channel 
jack did not believe that the schooner would have ventured into so narrow a place and he fully hoped before long to catch sight of her the two boats pulled on for nearly half an hour the channel as they advanced narrowing till the lieutenants became convinced that the schooner could not without wind have got so far ahead they accordingly pulled round being now satisfied that she must have gone up the channel into which needham had entered they had almost reached the mouth of it when distant shots were heard the next instant there came the sound of regular volleys fired in quick succession needham must have fallen into a trap i fear said jack we must hurry to his assistance give way my lads the men needed no urging and in a few minutes they were entering the channel though narrower at the mouth after they had gone some way up it widened and on sounding they found that there was water enough for a far larger vessel than the schooner the sound of the firing now became more distinct then it ceased it was too probable that needham had been cut off and he and his boat's crew destroyed still jack and terence though they might be exposed to a similar danger felt it was their duty to go on and ascertain the fact jack was standing up in the stern sheet so that he might obtain as far a view as possible up the river when he caught sight of a boat in the distance on she came towards them hurrah that must be needham he said no doubt about it answered terence in a short time needham's boat reached them the splintered oars and the white marks along the gunwales and sides showed the danger to which they had been exposed though of all her crew only two had been wounded needham said that he had pulled on not meeting with a human being and had begun to doubt that the schooner had gone up the channel when he suddenly saw her her sails furled and close in with the shore apparently being towed either by men or horses along the bank he had gone on some little way further to ascertain this when several shots were fired at him and as there was no object to gain by going farther he had pulled round and began to make the best of his way down the river immediately he did so a whole volley was fired at him from one side and directly after a second came peppering him from the other he now discovered that he had been caught in an ambush but as yet no one having been killed he hoped to get out of it the men at the oars pulled away lustily while the others returned the fire and as they believed knocked over several fellows who incautiously showed themselves after running the gauntlet for five or six minutes they got out of the range of the enemy's muskets and had since been unmolested neither had they seen any one on the banks jack and terence were unwilling to lose the chase now that she appeared almost within their grasp and yet they felt that it would be imprudent to expose their men and themselves to the fire of the numerous enemies posted under cover it will not do to give her up though exclaimed terence let us ask needham what he thinks jack put the question well sir to my mind we may have her and yet run no risk was the answer i know the way up the river and it's not likely that she has got very far from where i saw her now if we wait till dark we may pull up with muffled oars and as i do not think the enemy will expect us we may be up to her before they find us out the moon won't rise for the next four hours and we shall have time to board and get her under way before then the breeze you see is setting down the channel and if it holds as at present we shall have an easy job or if she should take the ground and we find that we cannot get her off we can but set her on fire and so have done with her jack and terence thought needham's plan a good one and resolved to carry it out trusting to his sagacity to pilot them up to where they hoped to find the schooner a short distance off was a high bank which projected some way into the channel as the trees which grew on it hung over the water it would afford shelter to the boats and the men well there might take some refreshment and snatch a couple of hours sleep they accordingly pulled in and found that the place fully answered their expectations jack was too wise however not to take precaution against surprise he and terence having landed fixed on four spots at which they posted sentries armed with muskets and cutlasses leaving orders with them to fire should the enemy appear and then to retreat to the boats they had been so carefully concealed among the boughs that even should any one pass up or down the channel jack felt sure that they were not likely to be discovered 
biscuit and beef with grog having been served out the rest of the men lay down along the thwarts or at the bottom of the boats to enjoy such rest as could be found jack and terence however sat up they were too anxious about the success of the expedition to sleep indeed they rather doubted whether they were wise in venturing up the narrow channel through which they might possibly have to run the gauntlet on their return between two fires from a vastly superior number of foes we have often had to encounter far greater dangers observed terence yes but then we did not knowingly run into them said jack and that makes all the difference still neither of them liked to abandon the enterprise they calculated that half an hour would carry them up to the schooner and little more than that time supposing the breeze should hold would enable them to get clear of the channel it won't take as many minutes to capture her so we need not allow much time for that observed jack we may give the men at all events nearly three hours rest three hours went slowly by at last they roused up the crew called in the sentries and shoved off the oars were muffled as proposed and by keeping in the centre of the channel they hoped not to be heard by the enemy though of course they ran the risk of being seen should any one be on the lookout no lights were however observed on the shore or anything to indicate that the banks were inhabited indeed the brushwood came close down to the water needham acting as pilot led the way jack's boat came next and terence brought up the rear except for the usual cry of the night birds and the quacking of frogs which issued from the forest no sound broke the silence which brooded over the water the current was very slight and scarcely impeded their progress never did a half hour appear so long jack strained his eyes hoping every instant to catch sight of the schooner but needham pulled on steadily as if he knew that she was still some way ahead at length jack observed that his oars ceased to move and he accordingly pulled up alongside his boat there she is sir he whispered i can just catch sight of her fore topgallant mast against the sky over the trees jack communicated the information to terence and then silently as before they pulled on were the crew of the schooner asleep or had they abandoned her in either case her capture would be easy closer and closer they got till they could all see her with perfect distinctness her yards across and her sails bent for a moment or two jack expected to receive her broadside or to have a volley of musketry opened on the boats no movement however was perceived on board he now took the lead directing adair to pull for the bow and needham for the quarter while he intended to board her by the main chains it was evident that they were not expected the boat's crews gave way altogether jack was the first alongside he quickly sprang on deck followed by his men adair and needham were a few seconds behind him scarcely had he gained the deck than looking down the main hatchway he observed a bright light a stilling column of smoke issuing immediately afterwards back all of you back to the boats he shouted and was in the act of springing after his men who were jumping over the sides when he felt his feet lifted up and an instant afterwards he found himself in the water amid fragments of wreck several fathoms from the vessel from every part of which bright flames were fiercely bursting forth a few strokes carried him alongside his boat and his voice being heard by the men he was speedily hauled on board is there any one hurt was his first question no sir only a little scratch or two was the satisfactory answer the part of the deck blown up had fortunately been carried right over the boat the explosion had probably been produced by a small quantity of gunpowder had there been more of it my career would have been cut short thought jack he heard adair and needham inquiring for him all right he answered the rascals intended to play us a scurvy trick but they have been disappointed though we shall lose our prize the schooner was now burning fiercely from stem to stern the flames wreathing like snakes round her masts having already reached her spars compelled the boats to pull to a distance to avoid the risk of being crushed by them should they fall the instant they got beyond the shelter of the vessel a volley of musketry was fired at them from the shore 
the flames casting a bright light around exposing them to view the glare however at the same time showing them their enemy standing on an open space at the top of a bank they apparently forgetting that they could be seen as well as see jack's boat which carried a six-pounder in her bow pulling round he fired with good effect into their midst while the other boats opened with musketry several of the enemy were knocked over and the rest scampered off under cover a few of them firing however as soon as they could reload from behind their shelter there is very little honour or glory to be obtained by stopping to be peppered by these fellows observed adair jack agreed with him and giving the order to pull round he setting the example away went the boats down the channel a few shots whistled by them as long as they remained within the glare of the blazing vessel as she was already so much burnt that even had the spaniards succeeded in putting out the flames she would have been utterly useless jack did not think it worth while to remain to see what became of her even after they had got a considerable way down the passage they could see a bright glare in the sky which showed them that she was still burning and must inevitably be destroyed adair congratulated his messmate on his escape faith my dear jack i thought for a moment that you had been shot into the other world and that i should have had to take command of the supple jack he exclaimed believe me however it would have been the most unsatisfactory event in my life i am very sure of that answered jack it is a mercy however that no one was killed though some of the men i fear have been severely hurt yes two or three were struck by splinters when the schooner blew up and twice as many have been wounded by the bullets said adair the sooner the poor fellow's hurts can be looked to the better jack agreed with him and the boats were accordingly steered for the bank under which they had before brought up jack recollecting that he was in an enemy's country did not neglect to place sentries on shore as before the lanterns were then lit and the hurts of the people as carefully bound up as circumstances would allow two men in needham's boat were suffering from wounds while four in jack's had been more or less hurt one man had his hat carried off and his hair singed by the explosion though he had otherwise escaped as it was important to get back to the brig as soon as possible after provisions and grog had been served out the boats recommenced their downward passage the current being in their favour and daylight soon appearing the work was much easier as they had no difficulty in finding their way jack however could not help feeling some anxiety lest the brig left with so few hands on board might have been attacked during his absence though he was very sure should such have been the case that bevan would make a good fight of it his mind was relieved when he came in sight of her and saw the british ensign flying at her peak the boats were soon alongside and the wounded placed under the care of mctavish bevan informed him that jose gonzalves had gone on shore to obtain information and that he expected him off every second this provoked jack not a little as the wind was fair and though pretty well knocked up he was anxious to get under way immediately he was unwilling however to go without the man as he hoped that he might be of use in recovering tom and gerald though he sometimes doubted how far he could carry out his promises indeed he had his suspicions that monsieur jose might be a spy and was as likely to carry information to rosas as to help the midshipmen to escape if we lose the breeze we cannot tell how long we may be detained here he exclaimed as he impatiently walked the deck we will give him another hour however if he does not then appear we must sail without him the cable in the meantime was hove short the topsails loosed and every preparation made for getting under way the hour had nearly passed when bevan exclaimed i see him sir at the end of the point he is waving his handkerchief as agreed on a boat was accordingly dispatched and jose came on board he excused himself by saying that he had fallen in with some people whom he took to be enemies and that he had to conceal himself till they passed by and what information do you bring us asked jack that another schooner and two gunboats have been destroyed to prevent them from falling into the hands of your countrymen and that not another vessel belonging to general rosas remains afloat answered jose 
this was satisfactory news as jack now considered that he might carry out the second part of his instructions and proceed up the parana to rejoin the squadron already some way ahead searching for tom and gerald as he went along the anchor was hove up sail was made and with a fair breeze he ran out of the river he had not got far when he fell in with her majesty's sloop of war dashaway which had just come from montevideo and from her he received dispatches from the commodore he was still some distance below the place where jose had desired to be put on shore his patience was to be tried still further after he had run on about twenty miles it fell calm and he was compelled to bring up not far from ponta obligado completely knocked up he and terence at last turned in desiring to be called should the wind change or any occurrence of importance take place at all events rosas must have had fighting enough for the present and his people will not venture to attack us observed terence as they went below if they do we must let long tom speak to them in return answered jack as he threw himself on his bed in half a minute he was fast asleep End of section thirty one